Hi guys, today we are going to dive deeper into um, application layer protocols and I'll talk about socket communications and HTTP. Okay, so as mentioned at the end of the last lecture, we have um, the process of communicating between two applications. Um, we have Facebook on our phone and we have Facebook uh, server application running in some data center and they communicate over a network. So what's happening is that the application sends messages between clients and server. Um, those messages are passed on to sockets and then processed by the rest of the networking stack as mentioned last time and application and transport are controlled or, uh, through the application layer which has exposed um, um, which has interfaces to the transport layer via sockets, the transport layer, network layer, and data link layer are all implemented at the OS, and at the data link layer, the operating system interacts with hardware um, to actually send data as electromagnetic signals or electrical signals or optical signals over the different hops of the network. So what we'll focus on today is the interface between applications and the transport layer via sockets. Okay, basically there are two ways of two transport protocols that are available to you um, in the internet. There are other transport protocols, there's tons of research proposals, but as it turns out, all the other proposals sort of fall either on the UDP side or on the TCP side. Um, and so often just those two are used, they also get through firewalls. Um, you know, and a lot of the solutions of the other transport protocols you can kind of achieve using these two protocols anyway. So those are the two solutions that just keep surviving because they occupy the space that's actually needed. They, they hit the two sides of the trade-off effectively. So UDP or user datagram protocol, you can think of it as unreliable data transfer. So to send data from client to server or between two endpoints, you don't need to set up a connection. They don't need to pre-communicate to figure out if they are online. You just kind of address a packet and send it off. It's sort of like sending a letter. You just address it, put it in a mailbox, and hopefully someone is at the other end to receive it. There is no flow control, which means that you can send more data than the client can receive. You can overwhelm the receiver. There is no congestion control meaning you can send so much data you overload the network, you create congestion in the network, and there are no guarantees on end-to-end -end delivery, throughput, or any sort of security guarantees. So this is basically just send data on the network and let it rip. Um, now, this is great for sending individual messages where, which may or may not get lost. It's not great for transferring lots of data because lots of data can overwhelm the network or the receiver, and so we need something like Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. Um, and you can think of it as reliable stream transport. The reliability is uh, uh, not fully guaranteed, but okay. TCP is connection oriented, meaning that before you get to send any data, you actually need to, or TCP will figure out if the receiver is there and ready to, to receive it. There is flow control, meaning that the receiver can kind of tell the sender, hey, you're sending me too much data, don't send any more until I get a chance to process what I already have. There is congestion control, which means that effectively the network can send a signal saying, hey, there's too much data being sent, you need to kind of back off on your sending rate. But there are still no guarantees on end-to-end -end delay. That is just a fact of packet switch networks. Uh, there are no guarantees on throughput, even though TCP will try to maximize throughput. And there are also no guarantees on security. When we get deeper into the uh, transport layer portion of our lectures, we'll talk about how these mechanisms are implemented. And I'll give you guys options for protocols that you can use to achieve sort of guarantees on end-to-end -end delay um, and as well as uh, security guarantees on your traffic. Okay, so let's look at how socket programming works at a high level. Here on the left is UDP, on the right is TCP, and I'll walk you through this. So this is in Python. We're going to import socket. And then on the server side, so this is server code, 
we're going to create a socket and we will say this is an AFI net socket, um, which basically means an IP socket. This is a kind of old naming convention that still survives to this day. Um, and this is going to be a datagram socket, which was a datagram is part of a packet. This is also an old naming convention, but this basically means UDP. Okay, and we're going to bind the socket to um, a particular address and a particular port, meaning that this socket will pick up data sent to this address. This is um, a local address, meaning kind of this particular host, meaning us. And uh, we will use port 5000 to receive, on, on which to receive data. And I'll get into kind of this stuff a little bit later too. So for now, we're just um, kind of reserving a particular socket on this port. Um, on the client side, this would be the other application. We would also open a socket that's a, uh, an IP UDP socket, and we would send bytes to the socket S that we just created. Um, you can say whatever, hello, convert it to bytes, um, and then you're sending this data to a particular IP address and a particular port. Okay, so to do this, you do need to know the IP address of the server, right? The server doesn't need to know it, it just says me over here, but the sender does need to know the IP address of the server, and it does need to know the port on which the server is listening, right? This would be kind of configured as part of your application startup, okay? Then back to the server, the server can call uh, socket receive from buffer, it specifies buffer size, meaning how many bytes it wants to receive uh, in this request um, and um, those will appear here as data and the address of the sender, meaning the IP address of the sender will also be returned. Okay, so pretty, pretty simple. On the TCP, there is a little bit of more work to be done. So what we have, we also need to import socket, great. We set up a socket, an IP socket, and now we set up a socket stream, which basically means a TCP socket. Okay. We're going to bind the socket to our local port and sorry, our local IP address and port 80. Port 80 is typically used for um, HTTP requests. I'll talk about reserved ports a little bit later, but um, ports 80 are open for, uh, are used for receiving HTTP requests and um, having a known port is also helpful because the firewall can then allow incoming traffic only on port 80, for example, to a web server and block all other kind of uh, traffic to that server. And we're going to then listen for connections on that socket, and this will accept one connection at a time. Okay, so there can, there can only be one connected client at a time. Now on the client side, we're going to also open a socket, and we're going to have a connect call, okay, um, on the IP address of the server and on port 80. So we do need to know the IP address. Now, when we do a connect, we need to then look at what's going on on the server. So this will kind of start opening connections, send a TCP SYN packet, and on the server, the server basically starts listening, and then it starts this socket.accept call. So this is a blocking call, and when a client tries to connect, this call will return, creating a new socket. Okay, I'll come back to that and we'll also return the address of the client. Okay, now the server can start receiving data. Now, for it, that receive to return anything, um, once the server accepts the connection, this connect call returns, allowing the sender, the client, to send some data. This is a GET request, HTTP GET request. I'll talk about those in a second. And when they send the GET request, um, the server will be able to receive some data and then send some data back. Um, this is just echoing this data, which is not particularly useful, but there you go. Um, and so when the data is sent back, now the client can receive the reply and so um, they can sort of keep communicating. Right? So once we have a socket connected, and accepted by the server, the client can keep sending and receiving data through socket S, and the server to communicate with that particular client uses this connection socket to do all the communication with this particular client. 
if we allowed more clients to connect by changing this number, each accept would return a new connection to each of the clients, um, which is great because that means that your web server can serve data to multiple clients at a time, not just one, um, not just one at a time. Okay, so um, I've recorded some videos. The links to that are here uh, that show you guys how to connect to, how to set this up in, in Python. Um, I'll play those now and as part of the lecture because this is what I do in class, but you can also go to those later and um, um, kind of watch them uh, as standalone things. Okay, I wanted to show you guys how to set up UDP communications between a client and a server. So on the left side of the screen here, we have the client code and on the right side of the screen, we have the server code. So uh, this is in Python 3.6, but it's gonna be pretty similar other than the print statements in uh, Python 2.7. So what happens on the server side is uh, we first import the socket library, which allows us to open sockets. And then we open a socket assigned to variable s for af inet, which is which means IP, and then socket datagram, which means UDP. I have that saved up here in comments. Uh, from there, we're going to bind the socket to um, our local host IP um, and port 5000. And from then on, this um, server will start listening to packets coming in on the port to this particular IP. Um, as data arrives, we can then call um, the socket to receive data from the buffer. So here we're going to receive whatever data the socket has, up to 64 bytes of that data, and this returns a tuple, data and address from which um, the data has been received. And then finally we can print out the data um, by first decoding it from UTF-8. Okay. So what happens on the client? On the client, similarly, we import the socket. From there, we um, open the socket in the same way as on the server. And now instead of binding and uh, receiving from the socket, we're going to send to the socket this particular data, which is the string hello. Um, and because we need to send bytes, not a string into the socket, we're going to encode that string into bytes using the UTF-8 encoding. And then we set the destination address and port. Okay, so let's see if we can run this. Um, we will, ah, wrong screen, here we go. We will start the receiver. Okay. And here we will start the sender. Okay, and so what you see is that the receiver prints out here, receive message, hello. And that is the end of this demonstration. Hi, right, great. And here is an example of TCP communication. Here is an example of communications using UDP sockets. Again, we have the server on the right and the client on the left. So starting with the server, we're opening a TCP socket indicated here by SockStream. Um, we bind the socket to our local host address and port 8080. On a normal web server, this would be port 80, but since I'm running a web server, that port is blocked from my computer. You can use 8080 or really any other port as an alternative, um, almost any other port. Okay, um, then we uh, listen for connections. Here we're going to allow up to one um, simultaneous connections. Once we have a connection, we can then um, accept that connection um, and we'll get a connection uh, variable and the address on which we connected. At that point, you can start receiving requests on that connection and we'll receive up to 64 bytes. I will print out the request and then we will uh, send a response also to the connection um, encoding it as UTF-8 as in the UDP example. Finally, we close the socket to release um, the ports. On the sender side, um, we have, um, we open a socket, a stream socket as on the server. We connect to um, our local address port 8080, which is the server address. Um, and then we send a request to the socket, okay? 
um, and then afterwards we will um, send we will process the response from the server by receiving 64 bytes of it um, and printing out the response notice that on the client side you're communicating with using the socket variable while on the server side you communicating using the connection the reason is that the socket is long-lived and there could be many connections being accepted by the different um, threads potentially and so here you have connection becomes sort of the new socket variable whereas on the sender you are still using the socket that you used to connect um, I will make the reason for this more clear in the lectures or on the lecture slides depending on when you are watching this video okay um, so um, Here's what happens when the connection actually happens in uh, more detail. So what we have is a client and a uh, server. And here's the kind of connection code as described earlier. Now, over time on the kind of descending y-axis here, this is what happens. Initially, we open a, uh, we bind a TCP socket here on uh, local address and port 80. And this is a server socket. Then client attempts to connect to the IP address of the server on port 80. Okay, so the client creates a socket that is to the server IP on port 80 from client IP on port 5000. The port here doesn't matter, it's just any outgoing port. Okay, and when the connection is accepted, there is a new connection socket return, and that connection socket is um, between the local host, okay, which is still the server, and some random port, let's call it 1234, why not, and the IP address of the client and the port of the client. Okay? So established sockets are identified by a four tuple, which is client IP. Um, or one end host IP, one end host port, and second end host IP, second end host port. Okay? And those could have different meaning on each of the hosts. And they're kind of different values at each of the hosts, but still connect uh, kind of these two internet hosts. Okay. So that's socket programming at a high level. We'll get into the details of transport protocols when we talk about the transport layer. Um, but now I wanna move on to the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP, which is, how, um, which is what websites use to get data from um, the servers or what clients use to get websites from the servers. Okay, so HTTP was built to carry hypertext markup language, HTML. Um, lots of evolution there, now we're at HTML5, um, and it basically creates a grouping between objects and content. So you have some uh, content that is HTML, and then there are embedded objects, um, which could be scripts, it could be images, could be video. Um, HTML kind of groups it all together, and also allows the browser to render it on a page. So it's a standard, and there's browsers that kind of um, implement the standard of rendering HTML. Okay. Objects in HTML are identified using uniform resource locators or URLs, and this is an addressing scheme for web objects. So um, there's a scheme which would be, for example, HTTP, okay, um, colon slash slash. You have domain, which would be NewYorkTimes.com or an IP address, and then you can specify port or not. Um, if you don't specify port, it's going to be um, for example, 80, if you're using HTTP here as a scheme, if you're using HTTPS, it would be a different port. Um, there's other schemes you can use. Then you have slash, then you have a path, um, which is kind of like slash index or, you know, wherever the file actually kind of resides on the server. And after a question mark, you can have a query string, and then you can have a, uh, a, a pound sign and then a fragment ID, which gets you to a particular part of the page. Okay, so um, some of all of the elements of URL are used. Okay. Um, 
All right, so then HTTP will support HTML and HTTP, the one thing to remember that's key is that it's a stateless protocol, meaning that each request coming to the server is thought of as a unique request by the server. There is no kind of memory on the server between requests, though mm, that is not exactly true. This is kind of the design and there's some other ways to, to save client state um, between requests. Okay. So um, here's how an HTTP request looks like. We're calling HTTP to some server.com. Then we have a path to index.htm or HTML. Um, and to get the contents of that address, of that URL, we're going to issue a GET request. And then the server will apply to us, hopefully with an OK uh, status code plus the data that we actually wanted. So what the GET request looks like is as follows. We have get to index HTML, which is the resource we actually want, over HTTP 1.1, which is the protocol version, okay? Then we have an R and an N, so that's a, a carriage return and a new line. Then we specify the host we're connecting to. This is kind of this portion of the URL, okay? We can specify other header lines, such as user agents, maybe this is a request from Firefox, uh, we can say what type of responses we'll accept, which would be a text or an HTML, uh, accept language. We can say um, there's a keep alive, which means uh, we will kind of um, stay alive for uh, this long and then we should request. Um, uh, we have a connection, which we'll try to keep alive um, for um, kind of this, this duration. So basically this, the client will wait this long to receive the data. Okay. Um, and then to finish this request, we have a double um, RN to say this is the end. So what you're seeing here is sort of an old protocol, which is very, very verbose, right? It's not in binary and it's human readable. So um, there are other protocols like this, but and this is one of them. So what happens is you can actually form these requests yourselves, which I will show you um, in a second. Okay. You can also kind of define the HTTP message format in this sort of structure, which is like a packet structure where you have a method. This would be get, head, post, pull, or delete. Those are kind of the options you have. You have a space, then you specify URL, then a space, then the version number of the protocol, and then a carriage return and a line feed, um, which basically I just described this first line. Okay, so what can you do? Well, you can get some data from the server. You can make a request. Um, you can get the resource metadata by saying head. Um, this will give you some information, but not the actual content. You can post data, which is actually sending data to the server. Um, you can put data, which is basically putting a file at a particular URL. Most servers will reject that request because they don't want you changing the content they have. Um, and similar is for delete. But if you're running your own server, you can kind of open the processing of these requests um, to the client. Okay. And then in response, you're going to get um, HTTP 1, 1.1, which is the uh, version of the protocol, the status code number, and then the status code name. And maybe this is a closed connection because you're getting the response. Okay. And then some data will follow. So other types of responses, response codes, could be HTTP OK, which is data included. We know this. Could be a bad request. The server couldn't process this request, couldn't understand it. It could be that you're requesting a resource at a URL that the server doesn't know about. Could get a 404, the resource is not found. Um, or you could get 505 versions not supported. Um, you could get, um, I guess, sorry, this is an error. Data is not included on that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other requests. Um, there's a link to that on your, mm, on your project page so you can see all of them and kind of choose appropriately what the server, uh, how the server should respond to your requests. Okay. Um, here's a video um, I made today actually for you guys, um, which is an example of uh, rolling your own HTTP request. Hi guys, here is a quick demo on how to form HTTP requests and send them out using Telnet. Um, this shows you that HTTP uh, has these kind of verbose packets that you can in fact type out yourselves. So what I have here is
a terminal window, instructions from your book, and the Wireshark network analyzer, uh, which you will use in your labs. So what I'm going to do is connect to Wi-Fi, which is the interface that I'm using to connect to the internet. Now, you see that there's all kinds of traffic being sent and received by my computer. I'm not particularly interested in all of it, so I can just set up a filter to watch HTTP traffic, which um, nothing's being sent on HTTP right now. So what I'm going to do is use Telnet to connect to gaia.cs.ums.edu on port 80, which is the standard port for HTTP requests. Okay, so I do that here. Um, and now I can form the HTTP request, copy that in here, okay? And we have a get, we have the resource we're requesting, we have the protocol we're going to be using, and I need to specify the host. Now I press enter twice to finish the packet, okay? And you see that um, the packet was sent and that we received a reply. Now let's see what's going on in the traffic um, by viewing the traffic in the analyzer. So we have the get request and we have the reply which is HTTP 200 OK which um, contains the contents of the reply which is this HTML page that was returned by the server that if this request was made by, by the browser now this HTTP can be rendered by the browser. All right so let's look at this get. Um, we have unsurprisingly, different stacks of the protocol. So we have the application layer, which is hypertext transfer protocol. We have TCP, which is the transport layer. We have IP, which is the uh, network layer. We have uh, Ethernet, which is the link layer. And then we have um, the frame, which is what's being sent to the physical layer. So if you look at the whole packet, you see that this is the frame that was sent. This is the Ethernet portion of bytes. Uh, this is IP. This is TCP. Um, and then here's the contents of the, of the message, which you can see is the GET. OK, so you can open this up. Um, and you can see that the GET request is to Gaia. It's got a return. Um, and you can look at it in more detail where we have the GET. Um, and it kind of breaks it down into HTTP fields of get, URI, uh, request version, and then the host, and then the double escape line. Okay? So Wireshark can kind of look at your packets and break them down into the different fields. And then likewise, we can look at the OK packet. HTTP is already opened. And so you see the HTTP 1.1, 200 OK, response version, status code. Um, and then you have... Um, other kinds of stuff that doesn't interest us, though it's part of the HTTP reply, for example, content type. Um, and then you have the request that's coming back and um, let's see, there's the data. Okay, I guess it's um, all right here if we open this up it shows you the actual contents of the packet um, being sent back or the contents of the reply, which is this um, HTML. All right, so here's a, just a very quick overview of how you can kind of roll your own HTTP packets, send them, get a reply, and then use Wireshark to observe what happens. Okay, um, so to Form HTTP requests, you don't actually have to write the packets out yourself. There are packages that will help you do that. Um, so what you can use is HTTP lib in Python or URL lib. There are also packages that will basically implement an HTTP server from you kind of pretty effectively. I encourage you guys to find them and use them in your um, programming assignments. It will make things a lot faster. Um, yeah, and so one other thing to remember is that uh, HTTP relies on TCP. HTTP is not a transfer protocol. It is an application layer protocol, um, which then creates messages that are sent over TCP. Okay. Um, so one question is, what is the format of data returned by the read functions? 
uh, which would be where's the read function here okay and the format would be a well formatted HTTP reply in this case um, which you may need to parse yourself or you can uh, kind of find a package that will parse an HTTP reply to you and just allow you to query for different fields okay um, Two more things I want to talk about as far as HTTP. The first one is transfer modes. So let's say that we're requesting an, uh, an HTML which contains uh, in the body of the HTML um, objects such as picture one and picture two, and those would be rendered by the browser. So what is happening? Well, first we're going to get the index HTM, um, which is this. Then the browser will say, okay, great, they are embedded objects and now I need to request those as well so I'll send a get for picture one okay gets me the content get for picture two okay gets me the contents now the question is how do those transfers actually happen in HTTP the way they happen is different across different HTTP versions so in the first version of HTTP 1.0 which is not currently used um, HTTP would use non-persistent connections what this means is that the request for each object of the three objects would be done over a separate TCP connection. When we talk about TCP, you'll see that the transfer rate of TCP ramps up over time. So the more data you send, the more accurate throughput you're getting. The throughput kind of expands into available network resources. And so if we're starting a new connection for each object, there is this ramp up, which means you're not actually getting very good throughput on average. Okay. Um, and because you're creating multiple TCP connections to the server, that actually ends up um, wasting server resources because for each connection, the server needs to allocate some memory. All right, so people came up with HTTP 1.1, which relies on persistent uh, TCP connections. Okay? So we have one TCP connection for all objects. That's great because there's lower overhead for the server, and now the connection can kind of ramp up its throughput to the available network resources. Um, the different GET requests would be issued, the messages would be issued over the same TCP connection, um, and as I said, allow TCP to reach high transfer rates. Okay, so the problem with this is that we're still sending kind of one request at a time, they're just reusing the same TCP connection. So HTTP 2.0, which is uh, has been standardized, I guess, over the last couple of years. There was something called Quick before. Um, I did some research on this stuff as well. Um, but now it's, I think, pretty much a done deal on how to do this. Um, allows multiple elements to be loaded in a parallel over the same connection. Okay, So we're still using one TCP connection and we can issue multiple GET requests kind of one after the other and the server can reply to them at once, meaning that it can send some bytes for picture one, then some bytes for picture two, it can kind of interleave the replies. Now this has um, several advantages in that it eliminates head of line blocking. So what can happen is that if we request picture one, it's a really big picture, um, in HTTP 1.1, the server would be sending all the data for picture one, whereas maybe there is some other more important resource like some script um, that is required to render the page or picture two maybe is more important. Who knows? There's some other high priority thing that the server now can't transfer because it's busy transferring picture one under HTTP 1.1. In HTTP 2.0, you can make the request for all the objects and then the server can prioritize which bytes it sent first or the client can send, can basically specify priorities for the different objects and change them while the objects are being transferred to say, hey, I want picture two to be sent first to me for some reason, or some script to be sent first to me for some reason. Okay, There are some other benefits to uh, HTTP 2.0, such as server compression, uh, sorry, header compression. So instead of using this kind of very verbose protocol, it can compress those headers um, and send them as binary. Okay, And there's one other thing which allows the server to basically push data to client, which the server thinks the client could be interested in, um, like some updates, for example. Um, 
In practice, this is never used because, or rarely used because servers have a hard time deciding what the client actually wants, right? So we still rely mostly on clients to request the content. Okay, and the last thing I wanna talk about is cookies. So um, I think this is the last thing or maybe there's one more, okay. Um, so as I mentioned, HTTP is stateless, meaning that the server doesn't remember anything uh, from between one request to the other. Um, and so it often ends up resending a lot of um, data which wastes network resources, that's not great. So what people came up with is this alternative mechanism of cookies which allows some state to be saved um, but not in server memory, okay? So what happens here is that the client sends a post request including form data, maybe you filled out some form on, uh, on a website and now that data needs to be sent to the server. Great. So the server will receive that form data and push it into a database and say um, send the reply and have a set cookie header and it will give the cookie ID. Okay. Now the client can take that cookie ID or the cookie rather and put it into a file that the browser uses, uh, or maybe in browser memory, depending how the browser implements it. Now, on a subsequent request, when the client wants to get a page, it can send the cookie, which then the server can use to read state from the database and say, oh, okay, this user uh, is described by this form data, now I can customize the reply, or customize the content that I'm serving based on some data that I read from the database. Okay, so that's, pretty great. Um, this can be used for authentication, this could be used for shopping content, uh, shopping cart contents to basically let server um, kind of load some data from the database before processing a get request from the client. Now the problem with this is that this is the idea of how this should work, that the cookie is a small thing but the state is actually uh, saved on the server. In practice, this may work differently. For example, the cookie could be large and could be saved. Uh, the server could be lazy, not want to use all its database resources, instead push more data to the client. The client ends up kind of resending the same data back to the server. Um, different websites can request to see certain cookies for traffic, uh, for, for tracking clients. And so mm, cookies are kind of a mechanism that can expose a lot of uh, information about a user's prior browsing sessions. So not a great mechanism from privacy perspective, but uh, quite a clever one in terms of keeping the servers light and still allowing uh, web applications to have the flexibility to save data between client requests on some database. Um, okay, so the last thing for today, I believe, is uh, caching which also solves the problem of um, servers resending data that could potentially waste bandwidth. So what happens is that a client issues a GET request, but instead of the GET request going all the way to the server, it goes to a cache server. Now that cache could be inside your network, for example at MSU, MSU has caches. This could be a cache that's kind of a little bit deeper in the internet, maybe provided by your network provided provider. And so the GET request goes to the cache, then the cache forwards the GET request to the server, there's a reply, but the cache actually saves the content of the reply before forwarding it to the client. So now, if there is another client in the organization that uses the same website or is interested in the same website, that second client will issue a GET request, and now the cache can say, oh, I've seen this request before, I know what the reply is to it, I can just send the okay without forwarding the get request to the server, okay? So obviously if the cache is in your network or an MSU's network, by caching some content, there will be less content going to the server, going outside of our network, reducing our network costs. And also the content can be served to local clients more quickly because it doesn't need to go all the way from the server. Okay, so there are some kind of benefits to the client. Now, these caches are often maintained by uh, content distribution networks, which have um, kind of different layers of these caches distributed throughout the internet. Um, and 
very rarely do uh, these content distribution network servers actually have to go to the original server or what's called the origin to get the data. They basically do it once and then once uh, a CDN cache has it, um, it will give it to smaller caches and smaller caches and smaller caches that are near and near to the client. We'll talk about CDNs in more detail later on. Um, but just to know that it doesn't mean that has to be one cache, there could be different layers of these caches, some that are closer to clients, some that are deeper in the internet and have more kind of space to save um, web data. One important mechanism is for caching is the conditional get. Okay, so when the cache sends a get to the server, it includes this header saying if modified since and then a date. So the server will reply to it um, with a new content if the content on the server has changed since that date, or it will reply with the 304 response code not modified. Okay, so this is even though the request from the client goes to the cache and then ultimately to the server, the reply is much quicker because instead of sending the whole content, the server can just send a quick request saying not modified, and then the cache says, Great, I already have the content, I can send it to the client. Um, so that's at a high level how HTTP caching works. Okay, just explained that part, so I guess I don't get to ask you guys that question. And uh, that finishes the lecture for today. It was, I think, a little bit of a long one, but um, that's okay. I will talk to you guys later in um, office hours if you have any questions about it. All right, thanks, bye.